Welcome to our second nurse webinar of 2019 entitled Living with Parkinson's Disease During Transitions in Care. This webinar is in celebration of Nurse Appreciation Week and we certainly appreciate all the ner nurses in our off audience this morning and this afternoon, depending on the time zone you're in, that are taking time out to listen to this very important topic. Our webinar series showcases the work of our nurse scholars who completed the Edmund J. Safra Visiting Nurse Faculty Program at Parkinson's Foundation. Today's webinar features Diane Ellis, Melissa O'Connor, and Shelley Hickey. You'll hear much more about our three excellent speakers in just a moment. But first, a little housekeeping. The PowerPoint slide deck can be downloaded from the reminder email you received this morning or from the Parkinson's Foundation webpage highlighting this talk, or on the page you're looking at to the left. Health professionals can earn one free continuing education credit through the American Society on Aging. Participants will receive an email after today's webinar with steps on how to collect the CEU. You have just 30 days when the CEU is available, that is until June 7th, to collect the free CEU. However, all of our programs are archived and you may watch indefinitely. Before I introduce our three guest speakers, I'd like to just say a few words to introduce our topic, Living with Parkinson's Disease during Physicians in Care. Chronic conditions as you know, are very common among older adults, with 85% of older adults having at least one chronic condition, 60% or more having at least two chronic conditions. As we know, Parkinson's disease is one of these many chronic conditions. Those with chronic conditions register more physician visits, emergency room visits, and hospitalizations, with that number increasing proportionally to the number of chronic conditions. So it is not uh, unlikely that our Parkinson's patients have more than one chronic condition and also are high utilizers of the healthcare system. Care transitions, broadly defined, are those transitions of movement across and within settings of care and or between providers. For example, from home to the emergency room, home to the hospital, hospital to a skilled care facility or rehabilitation center and then back home, any transition of care facility and setting. These are very vulnerable times for older adults with chronic conditions and poor outcomes and fragmented care are not uncommon. Mary Naylor has developed a very nice graphic of the nursing role in essential features of transitional care. And I particularly like this model because it really reminds me of the importance that the nurses play in transitions for people with Parkinson's disease. We talked about educating our patients, which is certainly a core feature and an essential feature. But I particularly like how Mary Naylor talks about engaging. Um, many caregivers feel inadequate or, or ill-prepared for this discharge from the hospital or transitions in care. And we need to really engage them in these conversations and not just educate them on the specifics about disease process and medications and that sort of thing, but really engage them and get input. They know their, their patients best. In today's world, we have very complex care and managing it can be complicated further in Parkinson's disease by cognitive changes or depression or anxiety. Um, we also have healthcare systems that make it difficult to negotiate for many people with pre-authorizations, specialty pharmacies, pre-approvals, and those sorts of issues. Continuity of care is very important to nurses and especially important to the, the patient with the condition. And I think while we're making some progress with our electronic medical record and we're, we're seeing that more and more systems are talking to each other, that that is getting a little bit better. But I think we have a long way to go before we have true continuity of care from, from setting to setting. 
let's not forget the well-being of our constituent patients. Just the stress of moving from one caregiver to another caregiver can be very stressful. It's like getting to know a whole new person and a whole new routine. Um, and trust has to be built within the nurse-patient relationship. That sometimes takes a little bit of time. Accountability is really the role of the healthcare professional to provide comprehensive care, time care, and really ease the burden of our patients with chronic disease who are going through transitions. So all of these components, the six components that Mary Naylor has described, I think are very important and very essential to the nursing role in Parkinson's disease care transitions. Our objectives for today are really to define trans transitional care concepts and elements as they pertain to Parkinson's disease patients, discuss the key vulnerabilities of those with Parkinson's across care transitions, describe nursing research and education in transitional care stimulation for Parkinson's disease, and to contemplate nursing care avenues to improve transitional care for those with Parkinson's disease. At this point, I'd like to introduce our speakers. Diane Ellis is a clinical assistant professor at the Villanova University M. Louise Fitzpatrick College of Nursing, where she has been teaching for the past 14 years. She is a neuroscience and critical care nurse specialist with an extensive background working with patients with Parkinson's disease. Diane is the principal investigator for the Parkinson's Foundation funded study, an intra-professional mock code study, Parkinson's disease missed, omitted, or delayed simulation study for nurse anesthesia and nursing students. Her prior research on missed, delayed, and omitted Parkinson's disease medication has been presented at the International Quality and Safety and Nursing Education Forum in 2018 and will be presented at this year's World Parkinson's Congress. Diane was a 29 Edmund J. Safford, Visiting Nurse Scholar, and the lead author of a descriptive article entitled The Edmund J. Safford Visiting Nurse Faculty Program, an Innovative Model to Enhance Faculty Develop and Nursing Education on Parkinson's Disease. This article was chosen for inclusion in the National League of Nursing Center text, Building the Future of Nursing. Our second speaker is Dr. Ms. Lisa O'Connor who is an associate professor at the Villanova University M. Louise Fitzpatrick College of Nursing and a John Hartford Center Distinguished Educator in Geratological Nursing. She is a Claire Fagan Fellow and a National Hartford Center Geriatric Nursing Excellence Scholar. She also is a Eugene and Joseph Doyle Research Fellow, previously of the Center for Home Care Policy and Research in New York. Dr. O'Connor has extensive funded research and experience in the study of transitions in care, readiness for patient hospital and home care discharge. She is a co-investigator on the Parkinson's Foundation Nurse Faculty Grant held by Professor Ellis. Our third speaker is Shelley Hickey, and she is a clinical assistant professor at Villanova University, where she has 15 years of teaching experience. Her clinical expertise stems from 25 years as a cardiothoracic intensive care nurse, and her teaching philosophy strongly incorporates transitions from concepts to applications with active and service learning strategies. Among her many teaching duties, Shelley coordinates the international nursing fieldwork experience in 10 countries for undergraduate Villanova nursing students, bridging learning and culture diversity. She's also a co-investigator on Professor Ellis's Parkinson's Foundation study grant. At this time, I'd like to turn the presentation over to our guest, led first by Diane Ellis. Thank you, Gwen. So 
So the first picture that you're looking at here was our original study, which started in spring of 2018. It's myself in the front, to the left, Professor Shelley Hickey, in the back, Dr. Melissa O'Connor, and we were fortunate enough to have two undergraduate junior nursing students actually help us collect data. And when they started in spring of 2018, they still continued with us through our third and our fourth study, which Dr. O'Connor will be talking about at the very end, which we've um, developed a pilot for. So we're very fortunate that we've had Megan Galvin and Adeline Doyle to help us and have continued to help us. Just to give you some background and why we think this is such an important factor and, and, and so treatable and fixable is that 10 million people worldwide suffer from Parkinson's disease and it's estimated that nearly 1 million will be living with Parkinson's disease by the year 2020, which is next year, which is greater than MS, MD, ALS combined and that's per the Parkinson's Disease Foundation recent 2018. When people living with Parkinson's have missed omitted medications, their length of stay is increased. And this happens quite frequently within the acute care setting. And we want to try to educate to prevent this from occurring in the future because when we look at this next slide, talking about prior research, only 33% of hospitalized patients with Parkinson's disease in the United States return home. 63% are discharged to some type of facility. And close to 4% die just simply because their medication, usually carbidopa levodopa, is missed, omitted, or delayed. So these are very correctable, fixable activities that we as healthcare providers could prevent these statistics from occurring. We know that missed, late, omitted, or inappropriate medication cause significant comorbidity during hospitalization, which increases the risk of falls and aspirations for people living with Parkinson's disease. And we also know that most people with Parkinson's disease, when they are admitted to the acute care setting, they do not come in for Parkinson's disease, but they are admitted for some other type of possible elective surgery. And therefore, their Parkinson's medications are not seen as a priority. They're seen as something that could be missed. So we are trying to educate our students and our healthcare professionals to try to prevent that thought and make it more like a cardiac transplant when somebody's listed as no meds, that they would still get them. Hospitalized patients with Parkinson's disease do not receive the medications on time, experience an abrupt stoppage of medications omitted or inappropriately prescribed. Patients, as we know, who experience a transition in care are vulnerable for poor and costly outcomes. 61% of PD patients who experience an interruption of medication timing or omission suffer poor outcomes. The other thing that makes people living with Parkinson's disease unique is that when they are admitted to the acute care setting, their schedule does not coincide with the schedule of the acute care facility. And if a patient's medication is missed, they suffer outcomes as being frozen, not being able to speak, and therefore, if they do not have an advocate with them, they cannot advocate that their medication is needed, and therefore, they can suffer these poor outcomes, leading to reduced activities of daily living, loss of ability to move, talk, swallow, and participate in care. And lastly, the cost is almost double from 20 2002 to 2011 simply for something that we could prevent from happening. So our initial study in spring of 2018 was basically just to help increase awareness and educate undergraduate nursing students and faculty in missed, omitted, or delayed PD medications during care and transition. So our inclusion criteria was simple at first, senior nursing students in an accelerated uh, baccalaureate program 
and they were enrolled in a complex care course as seniors. Our second study was trying to be more innovative, trying to be more inclusive and broader. So we brought in nurse anesthesia and we had the patient actually experience a mock code. So it was nurse anesthesia and baccalaureate nursing students, but the focus always remained on a Parkinson's patient missed, omitted, delayed medication during an unfolding case study simulation. We still wanted to increase awareness and help educate undergraduate and graduate faculty and nursing students, because as our future results will show, even experienced nurses in the acute care setting thought that it was acceptable to miss uh, meds related to Parkinson's disease. So our study was to promote interprofessional comfortability and collabor collaboration between nurse anesthesia students and our senior students. And that was our study in fall of 2018. And this is a picture of how our group expanded to include the nurse anesthesia team that's behind the bed there, um, Carlene McLaughlin and Matt McCoy. We had a graduate student to the right, and we still had Megan Galvin and Adeline Doyle, our two, at this time, senior nursing students helped to collect data. To the left of myself, our simulation coordinator, because without the simulation, none of this would occur, and Dr. O'Connor behind her, and Professor Hickey. So each time we try to grow and be more creative, and to be more inclusive, and to be more innovative. So the design of both the IRB studies, simple five steps, informed consent, a pretest, an unfolding case study simulation, which did occur in the Fitzpatrick College of Nursing in our Learning Resource Center at Villanova University, then a debriefing session, and a post-test. And now I'll turn it over to my colleague, Professor Shelley Hickey. Thank you, Diane. So we, when we engaged on this journey that has grown, um, we've looked at the research and um, we looked at uh, studies about gaps in knowledge. And the studies showed that 70% of nursing faculty who were responsible for teaching content about Parkinson's disease did not feel comfortable or confident in their knowledge of the material. And 33% of those that were surveyed had no Parkinson's disease content in their nursing curricula at all. And as you saw from our first slide, the number of patients living with Parkinson's disease is growing exponentially. 46% of the faculty surveyed had no clinical mentored experience with patients suffering from Parkinson's disease. And I can say I did not participate in that study, but I would have fallen into a lot of um, those categories. We do here at the um, Fitzpatrick College of Nursing at Villanova include Parkinson's disease in our um, content. However, um, after 30 years of nursing experience, I did not have um, a great knowledge base. So the other thing um, that the study showed was that Parkinson's disease experts who looked at the readings and the lectures developed by the faculty that nursing faculty that participated in the study found that more than 97% of the materials submitted were out of date, misleading, or irrelevant. So we knew that there was a gap in knowledge in nursing education, and we wanted to focus on that. Um, so as we had shared. Um, earlier, the aim of our study was to increase awareness and educate not just undergraduate and graduate students, but undergraduate and graduate um, faculty. And 
so I'm sorry. Um, I'm not sure how that skipped. Let me just go back. Which slide would you like to be on? Um, the one that I'm looking at says Ames. I have it. Um, and so also our senior nursing um, students, as uh, Diane had shared, and their clinical and faculty, and then when we expanded our study to include the nurse anesthesia students, um, it was uh, senior level and um, currently junior level anesthesia students, as well as their faculty, were all part of the group that we wanted to reach with this information. So our methods um, were the same for both. It was a pre-test, post-test study. Participation was completely voluntary, and there was no um, penalty for not participating, and there was no penalty regarding grades for the students. And so our initial study, the study that we performed in um, spring of 2018 with a group of 94 second degree um, senior nursing students and their faculty, and this, these are the student results. So with our initial study, we saw a 53.6% increase in students' knowledge about the importance of the timing of Parkinson's disease medication. We also saw a 54.3% increase in the student knowledge regarding best practices regarding timing of Parkinson's disease medication and preventing missed or omitted doses. We saw a 71.3% increase in the student knowledge regarding side effects and complications that can happen from missed, omitted, or delayed Parkinson's disease medication administration. And we also saw a 46.8% increase in student knowledge um, regarding priority nursing care practices for people living with Parkinson's disease. So for the faculty, our study results um, were a, a little more impressive to us. Um, we saw a 71.4% increase in the faculty knowledge regarding the importance of Parkinson's disease medication timing, which ties back to the study that looked at a faculty knowledge base um, regarding um, Parkinson's disease and um, supports that um, faculty knowledge needed um, to be increased. We also saw a 57.1% increase in faculty knowledge regarding best practices to prevent missed, omitted, or delayed Parkinson's disease medications. We saw an 85.7% increase in the faculty knowledge regarding side effects and complications that can happen from missed, omitted, or delayed Parkinson's medications, and then a 57% increase in faculty knowledge regarding priority nursing care practices for people with Parkinson's disease. Our second study, as um, Diane has shared, um, we pulled in uh, graduate anesthesia students and um, ran a very similar simulation, used a similar methodology that it was a pre-test, post-test. Um, we again had 94 undergraduate senior nursing students participating. Um, and then we also had 24 um, senior nursing anesthesia students. And so this was an intra-professional simulation. So we had our undergrad senior nursing students working with the anesthesia students. And so regarding an increased knowledge base for carbidopa levodopa administration route, knowing that PO is the route 
for our undergrad BSN students, there was a 27.7% increase in knowledge. And our um, senior nursing anesthesia students, there was no change in knowledge. They had that knowledge base um, before the unfolding case study simulation occurred. And then for our undergraduate BSN students, they had a 74% increase in their knowledge related to missed, omitted, and delayed Parkinson's disease medications. And we also saw um, an increase in knowledge, 27.8%, for our nursing anesthesia students. For the faculty in the second study, for our undergraduate um, clinical faculty, there was only an N of 4. We had a lot of the same clinical faculty um, teaching the students in clinical that we had in the first study, so our N is smaller um, because of that. And there was also um, no change in knowledge base for the second group. So we're not sure if they were truly just knowledgeable or if um, they had heard about the study from the other faculty, clinical faculty members that participated in the first study. And then 57.4% um, of the other thing we looked at in the study, I'm sorry, was um, how comfortable our undergrad students were working with anesthesia personnel before simulation. And so we were able to see a 57.4% increase in comfortability of our undergrad students working with um, their grad level peers. And then post simulation, um, 94% of the students um, who said that they had no comfort working with an anesthesia provider, um, their comfort level increased. And so I just want to talk a little bit about the reason that we decided to utilize an unfolding simulated case study instead of just trying to um, impart this knowledge in a normal lecture sim, um, situation. So we looked at the research, and we looked at research about problem-based learning, about case-based learning, and about reflective practice. And what we were looking for was a pedagogy that would um, not just teach the sim the information, but help the students to retain the information. So to teach in a meaningful way, to have them experience it, and to have that information um, stay with them for an extended period of time. So the research that we looked at shared that problem-based learning is a more effective um, type of pedagogy for long-term knowledge retention, which is what we were look looking for. Um, we also knew that case-based learning goes beyond simple identification and correct answers. It's more of the application and analysis of information and um, increases critical thinking or changes behavior and generalizability of learning as a, the case continues to unfold. And then in reflective practice, so our debriefing, after the simulation, um, research shows that reflection has the opportunity to enhance clinical reasoning again. So again, we wanted to look at um, a teaching methodology that would not only present the students with the information, but present it in a way that they will retain that information across um, their nursing career. And so we utilized an unfolding case study sim. Um, to allow us to integrate knowledge, promote, promote higher level thinking. Um, we talked a lot about best practice and um, the reason to not miss, delay, um, or omit Parkinson's disease medications. We talked a lot about the timing of these medications and being a good advocate um, for your patients. Um, we wanted to present clinical situations perhaps that the students would not encounter in practice. However, for myself, just last week in clinical, we had a patient a person 
um, living with Parkinson's disease, who was indeed a surgical patient who had had his carbidopa levodopa held for two days. And a student that participated in this sim came and found me right after report and said, he needs his medication. And I said, yes, he does. So um, she retained this knowledge, which was wonderful. Um, we always are trying to link theory to practice. Um, we did give the students some prep work prior to the simulation. And then again, like I said, the reflection piece is so important um, for retention of information. And so we did an instructor-guided reflection at the end during um, a debriefing session with the students. And then um, I'm going to turn this over to my colleague, Dr. Melissa O'Connor. Great, thanks, Shelley. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about some patient safety implications, and many of you are very familiar with working with patients with Parkinson's disease and, and likely know a lot of these things, but it's worth repeating um, as a reminder for all of us and for those that perhaps are not so familiar. So three out of four people with Parkinson's disease do not get their meds on time in the hospital, which as you can see earlier in our background slides can really be devastating. People with Parkinson's are hospitalized 50% more than their peers who do not have Parkinson's. So it is very possible that healthcare professionals, particularly nurses working in the hospital, will work with at some point in their career someone who has Parkinson's disease. People with Parkinson's suffer avoidable complications at a higher rate than those who do not have Parkinson's. That results in longer hospitalization stays and a higher risk of mortality. So it's really important that we get the word out about um, missed, omitted, and delayed medications and their impact. So a call to action we would like to recommend that acute care settings, especially, integrate simulation as a yearly competency. Because as we've seen and as we know, timely administration of medications um, is incredibly important to patients with Parkinson's disease. Healthcare providers that are practicing today that are not specialists in Parkinson's disease and or who perhaps received training several years ago honestly may not remember or know how important the timely administration of medications are, especially to patients with Parkinson's disease. Our next recommendation is to encourage institutions of nursing education. So those of us that are giving this webinar especially, we take it very seriously to implement teaching strategies that allow retention of knowledge regarding timing of PD medications. So we certainly teach that to our nursing students, but we need to really help them learn and retain this knowledge. And finally, to partner with transitional care teams to integrate processes that prevent missed or omitted PD medications. So as a reminder, transitions we also refer to them as handoffs, or vulnerable exchange points that contribute to unnecessarily high rates of health services use and healthcare spending, and they expose chronically ill people to lapses in quality and safety. So this statement that was so well said by Dr. Mary Naylor is really true of anyone, but it is especially a dangerous time a transition or a handoff is an especially dangerous time for patients with PD. So while many chronically ill older adults experiencing a care transition are vulnerable for poor outcomes, PD patients are at particularly high risk any time when they're experiencing a transition, but especially when they're admitted to the hospital. When we don't adhere to their at-home schedules, and cause delays in obtaining medications. This can cause a reemergence of severe disease symptoms related to PD and dopamine withdrawal syndrome. So what we mean is such as being unable to swallow if, uh, and also aspiration. 
So the goal is to promote the safe and timely transfer of patients from one level of care to another or from one type of setting to another. So for instance, an OR to a step-down unit, a step-down unit to the floor or from the ER to a med surge floor. So this goal is really especially important for patients with PD. Healthcare providers, particularly nurses, our favorite, can help mitigate risk among hospitalized patients with PD. We are a critical step in preventing these poor outcomes from occurring in all patients, but especially in PD patients. Most often, it is the patients and their caregivers who are best informed and who really have a good understanding of their needs and their schedules, especially related to their PD meds. So it's, in, it's critical that all nurses, but especially those that are working in acute care, listen carefully, investigate home routines, conduct a thorough medication reconciliation, and encourage patient and or family caregiver involvement. In the meantime, understanding that PD medication routines are unique in this population and individually titrated. So these PD, these patients with PD really have unique needs. We need to adjust to them, which is not always what we do. Most of the time it's not what we do, especially in acute care. So as nurses, we really need to pay attention and be aware of what their particular schedules and needs are. So we are all incredibly excited here at Villanova to talk about our future project briefly. If you've noticed, with each study, we have moved forward and we have expanded what we did previously. So previously, we have conducted intra-professional simulations among nurses. And now we are going to conduct an interprofessional mock code involving a patient with Parkinson's disease and also related to missed, omitted, delayed medication. We are partnering with the Philadelphia College of Osteopathic Medicine, and we will be including in our mock code simulation students um, who are um, students of the Philadelphia College of Osteopathic Medicine, specifically doctors of osteopathic medicine that are fourth years, doctorates of psychology students, and then our own nursing students and senior nurse anesthesia students. We are really excited about this opportunity to work with PCOM, work with these other students from different disciplines as well as our own nurses, and really expand and, and um, learn more innovative ways to help patients with Parkinson's disease.